Hi everyone, and welcome to Life Edge, because life just doesn't have to be that mediocre. I'm Harold Muliati, and I'm joined today by our co-host, Dr. Susan Nash. How are you doing today, Susan? Good. Um, <laughs> strange gremlin locked out of the office because the magnetic the door gremlins. lock stopped working, but anyway, we have a good working around with Skype, so here we go. We have a great guest uh, with um, Brian Meyer, of XWorks, and so it's a good day. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. All right, let's get going. This show is sponsored by Relate Corporation at www.relate.com your training and video partner. And we're back and joining us in our center position of power. It's Brian Meyer of XWorks Technologies. Hi, guys. Hi, hi Brian. Thanks for coming on. And, My pleasure. Um, yes, it's great to have you here. And Brian, we're so thrilled because what you're doing is so interesting. I first met you almost three years ago and, and it had to do with with uh, what you were doing with pioneering work with drone recharging stations, and you've diversified a lot from that. So you might just give us, tell us a little bit about how you got started with drones. Sure, <clears throat> we, uh, I'm, my background's aviation. I'm an air transport category pilot and uh, been in business for about 15 years. And uh, as I saw the drone industry begin to rise, I decided, I took an interest in it in uh, probably 2015, and I have been focusing on that for quite some time and just being able to take uh, the technology that supports drone technology and um, coming along, making it better and making drones more useful in the space. Um, by uh, default, I had to kind of diversify the way we were doing uh, things and start building drones ourselves, but that was not our primary of interest. We um, uh, want the industry to support the drones and the drone building, and we just supply the uh, landing stations, which is what our specialty is. And so, as, as I understand it, the landing station is actually a recharging station, because that's one of the big problems with drones is lack of range. Could you tell us a little bit about more about that? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's more than a landing station. And if I can share my screen here, I can show you just a little bit of the demonstration that we have. But the, uh, it's more than just a landing station. The system actually um, replaces the battery. It's, a, it's actually a robot. And so we actually take the, the drone. And once we get to a position where we're ready to land, the system actually takes that drone and will uh, will we'll recover the drone and then also swap the battery. So we can essentially keep a drone in the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week with no human interaction. And uh, we have since got uh, the, the drones that are the, the station that you'll see in these videos is actually a system that um, that actually is our V2 system, that red uh, trailer that you see there, that's our version two. We have since come out with a version three. These All these videos that I have in our presentation are more than 18 months old. Um, but we have a version three that we've built for the military and we've also built and it's working actively in the oil and gas industry. And uh, it essentially will house two drones inside of it and coordinate those drones. So it's more than just a landing and charging station. It also replaces the battery. And once the battery is replaced, then it also will uh, uh, send up a second drone if necessary. And so it, it does a lot more than just uh, just the, and I'm going to turn off my camera to see if I can get the video a little bit smoother. Um, but it also, it does a lot more than just charge the, the batteries. It replaces the battery so that it continues to go on. It houses the drones for overnight use. It will actually coordinate the drones. Um, so the missions for what we do, the mission is actually not given to the drone. The mission is actually given to our station, and the station coordinates the drones um, for what it needs to do. So if, if there are a hundred miles of pipeline in a given area to, to inspect and drone number one can inspect the pipeline in a short period of time, um, uh, but a drone number one can only do mile one through 15 and drone number two can do mile 15 through 30 and drone number three can do XXX keeps on going, you get the picture. Then the artist station will actually launch drone number one 
and go one through 15. And before it gets done with number 15, drone number two would launch and go to mile 16. And drone number one returns back, replaces its battery, and then continues on the path. So it's the absolute fastest way and most efficient way of utilizing a drone in any industry at this point in time. I say in any industry, in any industry that has a given closed area. So uh, it's a, it's a um, significant radical step forward for drones, especially in the oil and gas industry. Um, and uh, we don't do just charging, but we our version one does charging as well. So it's a lot more than just charging to answer your question. Well, that makes sense. And, and I really like the fact that you've got all the waypoints and everything programmed in the station itself and the artists, uh, because if it, um, if you're counting on a, the drone having to go back to your central location, then you waste, you can't have any range. And second, you'd have to like just stop and reprogram that same or fix that same drone. This way you can just like use a second one. This, you can swap them out. It's so great. Yeah, it can essentially keep a drone in the air. If you have a, a sensor that you want to work um, nonstop, then that sensor could be placed in a singular location on the drone. And whenever the power source begins to get low, whether it be hydrocarbon or whether it be electric, when it begins to get low, the artist station will actually will know that and launch a secondary drone to take the place of that primary drone. And this, the primary oh, wow. drone will come off of its wow. station after the secondary drone arrives and it will just seamlessly switch over the video feed because all of the video feed is coming into the artist into one location. So the artist acts as the communications hub, the coordination hub, and uh, launches the drone, houses the drone. So the artist is much, much more than just a landing station in itself. It's the most advanced uh, way to operate a drone there is in the world today. And we were talking that's, that's to... Amazing. We were talking a little bit pre-show about why um, drones in particular are so important for um, uh, sensing leaks, for example, in, uh, w in an oil production operation. Could you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Um, whenever an individual takes a drone or takes a, uh, is responsible for leak detection, many times they're driving down a, uh, a road where they are in a pickup truck. This is the traditional way. And there are miles and miles and miles of line, pipeline laying all over the place, including fields, uh, along roads and bar ditches, across fields. And the pumper, the traditional way, is for him to drive um, across this area and bumping across the roads. He's looking out across his field and trying to determine if there's a leak in a pipeline uh, that may be a quarter of a mile away from him under four foot tall grass. So what we are doing under the gathering lines and under the, the areas where you have a, a bunch of oil sites in a given area is we're actually taking the drone out there and getting a bird's eye view down from the uh, top to try to detect those leaks. So here's a perfect example of one of our customers currently right now. That line that you see, that yellow line represents two miles as the crow flies, two miles. And in that area, the pumper that actually does this specific area has 20 well sites that he has to visit. They go from their home base of operation, they're on the right-hand side of the screen, and they drive this particular route. And he drives 30 miles per day inside of that two-mile area. So that's 7,800 miles per year that that pumper goes, and he's looking for leaks in a very short uh, uh, area, uh, area, but all over this site, if you can see my mouse, all over this area, there are pipes that run between these well sites that the pumper never can see. They're just not able to uh, physically, with their eyes, see these things. So uh, here's a short video of the actual leak detection uh, near this site. And uh, as, it fly, as the drone flies out uh, on these areas, you can just see that we can see things on the back side of well sites. This is actually, it has a slope where this drone is flying and our computers are seeing this leak and classifying it as a leak down back behind the well site. And you can see that leak actually started behind the well site. And uh, the pumper is driving at the front side of the well site. And if they're doing their job, they're walking around so they see them. But a lot of times they just won't see them in time. 
So our drone getting a bird's eye view can see it coming up on the well site before it ever even approaches. And then as we get here further in the video, you'll actually see a leak detection that is a long way away from uh, a well site. Now I know you can't tell in this particular picture, but this grass that's around here is about a foot and a half tall. The pumper never even saw that particular leak. We actually brought that to their attention and they never even saw it and it was uh, 25 feet away from the road. And the reason why is because they just can't physically see it from driving. So uh, this is all gathering system. Now this particular uh, leak here, this anomaly was actually found along a pipeline. You can see it's running between well sites and you can't see that driving on a road that's not there. I mean, you just cannot see that. So using a drone gets you bird's eye view uh, for leak detection along pipelines um, as, you're, as you're driving along. So there's just all kinds of, or as you're flying along, there's all kinds of benefits to getting the bird's eye view um, above your infrastructure rather than trying to drive along the side of the road and look out across your infrastructure. So what are you using to de to actually um, detect the leaks? Are you using uh, uh, hyperspectral sensors or or and using vegetation question. as a proxy or how, how exactly is that? Yeah, work? that's an excellent question. Um, in in the gathering system and in liquids, um, it's different than if you're in gases. In gases, you can't see it with an optical camera. But when we first started, we, we launched with infrared cameras and optical cameras uh, and multispectral and, and we're trying to do all these fancy things. And all the pumpers that we spoke to just said, hey, Brian, just give us a view of what we're seeing. Because and ultimately, it, whenever we're looking, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately, when we're looking for leaks, the ultimate thing that the pumper wants and here's um, hopefully this will autoplay. Um, ultimately, what the pumper wants is they just want to be able to see what's going on. They don't really care about uh, an infrared image that they may or they may or may not be able to read. And these pumpers are the ones that are responsible for their particular leaks. So these are all leaks that we have found along the, the time that we've been flying. And as you fly around it, the optical camera does a significant enough job to where the individual pumper can look at it and say, okay, I've got a leak. Um, so we're not using hyperspectral, multispectral, uh, infrared, or anything of that nature in the liquids world. And that's what our forte is right now. Our forte is taking the artist station and going in a specific range of area, uh, generally about six kilometers, and we launch the drones off of that area, and it goes out, inspects in kind of a hub and spoke, and looks a lot the pipelines uh, as it goes and then comes back, lands, swaps out its battery and goes out on another spoke and comes back, lands, swaps its battery, goes out another spoke. And it just simply works all day long looking for these leaks with an optical camera. Um, once we get into the gases a little bit more, um, then we will change over to a uh, an infrared camera. And we're doing the research on that right now. But as of right now, we're just using optical cameras and that is what our customers want. So, uh, does the uh, when it takes the footage of the flyovers, does it automatically flag things that are probable leaks, or is it mostly just from the pumper sort of reviewing the footage and seeing uh, what looks like a leak? It can flag. Um, the a lot of people believe <clears throat> a lot of people have uh, kind of a pie in the sky view of of artificial intelligence and how it works. You can train a system to identify a leak or an anomaly uh, over an area that the drone has has previously been trained on. Um, this particular area that I'm showing you, if you drive 50 miles or, or 20 miles away from this particular area, the, the terrain looks totally different. So to try to take the training that you do on the computer, uh, to try to take it from here to that other area 20 miles away, it just doesn't work. And sometimes it's within uh, a mile that the terrain doesn't work. Um, the albedo or the reflection from the sunlight is different on any given day. And that reflection of the sunlight will mess up your uh, and give you many false positives. This uh, particular training takes uh, a year uh, worth of data for the computer to be able to get this data, to be able to recognize anomalies. Now, eventually it will get there. But it, you can't 
you're, you're never going to get there if you never start, but you're not going to take a, a drone, throw it up in the sky. Anybody who says, <clears throat> excuse me, anybody who says, well, our system can recognize leaks immediately out of the box is plain wrong. They just right. they can't do right. that. Um, and you're not going to take a drone and launch yeah. it up there uh, and be able to detect, um, auto detect a something with an optical or even an infrared camera. Because uh, as you guys know, especially the, the um, Susan being a geologist, the waters at different levels have different temperatures. And based upon the day that you have, if it's summertime, the ground is going to be a hotter temperature <clears throat> than what you would uh, what, than what you would have in a, in a uh, winter day. And so if, the, if there is a shadow over it from a cloud or if there's not a shadow over it, that temperature that the infrared camera is seeing really makes a difference of is that groundwater from runoff or is that water from, uh, you know, a, a tank or is that water from a certain depth? So there's a lot involved in trying to spot leaks. We have found that the most effective way of doing it is to use an optical camera and to have many false flags in the beginning. And then as time goes by, that, that computer begins to learn um, what that particular area looks like in with no leaks. And then it, also, it just starts identifying anomalies as time goes by. So after, just to give you an idea, we've been working since 2016, 17 on this project. And just now in one of our areas, we're able to get a, a pretty high rate of uh, accuracy on those leaks. That's interesting. Well, so now I think that d detecting, say, oil leaks on on water bodies is somewhat easier, correct? Uh, on a body of water? Yes. I mean, because I know that a lot of people are using satellite imagery and also um, drone based to, to um, if there's a spill, they use the They go out and do a survey and they can tell the extent of the spill. Uh, probably on a on a water. I'm not familiar with with seeing it on an actual body of water. I'm actually seeing uh, my, what we what our forte is is trying to see it on a gathering system. So the video that is showing here is actually in a gathering system uh, amongst several well sites, and uh, we have not really uh, gone more than just the theoretical side with the gases and along long pipelines, ours is primarily the um, uh, gathering system. So we're looking at liquids in a gathering system uh, or around oil and gas well sites. And uh, we're getting a pretty high accuracy there, but uh, you have to be at that specific location for a long period of time. Now, if you've got something that is a simple contrast, for instance, um, if you know that the ground is always a range of temperature between this and this, and you know you're, you've got, you're drawing from such an XYZ reservoir and the temperature coming out of that, of that groundwater is always this, then as long as um, it's coming straight up and it's leaking right there where it's coming out of the ground, you can identify it. But if it goes into a separator and then it gets separated between salt water and oil, and then the salt water sits in the tank and then the salt water gets pumped out through a pipe that is, you know, 45 miles long, it seems like, <laughs> uh, cools yeah. along the ground and then has a leak right before it goes into the injection well, the downhole well, then, and it leaks there, then your water temperature can range from ground temperature to actually cooler than ground temperature. Uh, and you can't use just a regular thermal infrared camera to spot the differences between the temperature. All you can see is there's a puddle of water. Is that salt water or is that... Uh, groundwater that has bubbled up from a spring, or is that groundwater from last week's rain? So it really does right. take a yeah. lot of collection to get there. That's really helpful and useful. I, I actually was thinking of something else. I was thinking more about, let's say, that there was a, 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 a case of, of um, well, not just saltwater contamination, but oil leaking from tank batteries when we had recent floods, and they went here in Tulsa. And the tank batteries were, I guess they breached the berm or whatever, but it, the water went into a stream. I mean, the oil went into the stream. So, like, they, I, you could definitely see that just with basic um, aerial photography, that there was, like, brown stuff on top of the water. Yeah, the so film. It seems, like that, that you, it seems like that would be very useful. You could do that as well. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of reservoirs downstream from where we are looking at. Um, and, and without showing you a satellite overlay of exactly where we're at, but 
um, uh, even downstream from this particular image, there's actually uh, some downstream uh, places here. And we caught the leak as it reached the southernmost point here on your on your frame, but it could have easily leaked into some water reservoirs. And finding those water reservoirs and 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 after the fact, we've we've definitely seen it uh, film over on those uh, those ponds or those lakes or even some creeks. Mm, right. Very easy to see. You're exactly right. It's the film is just stands stands right out. So the main thing is to be there and be there quickly. So that's one of the advantages of drones as well. Absolutely. You know, the there's we try everything as the industry to try to spot leaks and try to be responsible environmentally. Um, and, uh, you know, pressure d differences just do not work all the time. We get pinhole leaks all the time, especially like in saltwater disposal lines. And it just will, uh, I've got a perfect example of it. And, and I'm sure, sure many of the, much of the people in the industry have seen this. But uh, whenever we were uh, looking at the North Dakota and the leaks there, this particular company, they said they drove past this. I believe it was for 30 days. This one in the background here drove uh, past this. The pumper drove past it. And it was found on March 16, 2016. And uh, I can't remember how many millions of barrels leaked out that they think. But they drove past it. The pumper drove past this area for 30 days. And so they, they missed wow. it. Well, if they had something looking at a bird's eye view, they would have caught this area really fast. So uh, if you have something that can go and inspect on a daily basis, sometimes twice a day to go and look for those specific leaks, um, it's, it's a huge tool for the, for the pumper and for the company themselves to be able to detect those leaks. I was reading a white paper and I was, I was uh, talking about this pre-show. I was reading a white paper, the best detector of leaks to date is still biological, that is still us. And so the second best thing that a, uh, an individual could do is use a tool to allow them to biologically detect a leak. So if the drone flies over and it's imaging something, that person looking at that, that, that leak is the best detector that we have, um, regardless of whether you have pressure sensors or uh, any other kind of sensor there is. So it's definitely the, the way to go. Well, I guess it's like That's you really said, the... AI takes a while to train, but if we can get actual intelligence in there and get get it looking at, at it from the right perspective and giving it that bird's eye view, then it's... Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, you know, we're at the very beginning of the artificial intelligence side of things. And uh, of course, it's going to improve significantly over time. Um, but right now, it's artificial intelligence is just not ready to do it on its own. But yeah. if, a, uh, you know, our contingent for our potential customers is if you don't start now, you won't have it in a year, the artificial intelligence, and it won't be to a place of perfection in five years if you don't start now. And regardless of what you do, the, the drone has to learn what your particular environment looks like uh, in the summer and in the winter and in the fall and in the spring and everywhere in between it has to catalog all that data and information it has to constantly train in order to be effective. It's not going to ever be as far as I know looking at it just from a technology point of view, you're never going to be able to take the data that you collected from someplace else with liquids and go to another location and use that same data and it work out of the box. Artificial no, intelligence. No. So to your point, if they're able to get the information um, from the drone and they get that information and the, the trained pumper who's already trained to look for leaks, if he's able to get that information and look for the leaks, it is just so much better than if he's just driving down the road on bumpy roads looking for you know uh, leaks as he's continuing his job, as he's doing his job. Yeah. And it's safer. I mean, I talked about distractive driving. <laughs> like driving and looking for leaks at the same time. Yeah, especially if it's on a highway. It's the most dangerous thing that a company does. It's the highest risk that a company does, driving wow. down roads. That makes sense. So what are your plans for the future? Well, um, for the future, we've got a lot of plans. And uh, I mean, this <laughs> particular slide here shows what the industry is facing. And uh, in the United States, this, this is a forecast put out by the FAA. This is not my information. This is FAA's information. 
And uh, to give you just an idea, there are 600,000 pilots worldwide right now. I'm talking about pilots that fly manned aircraft. 600,000 in the entire aviation industry, including commercial, private, everybody. Well, uh, according to the FAA, if drone technology continues going the way that it's going by 2022, and probably these numbers should be pushed back to 2023, we're looking between 450 and 719,000 commercial drones in the in the world, uh, in the United States, yeah. excuse me. So yeah. uh, the, the yeah. pilot curve there is the green curve, and it shows that we have on forecast 301,000 pilots, commercial drone pilots, period, in the United States to fly those 450 or 719,000 drones. There's no possible way that we are going to be able to staff that many drones. So something has got to change in the way that we look at <clears throat> how we're going to be flying these drones. Well, no matter what you do, no matter how you look at it, an individual has got to go out there and put a battery on a drone, launch that drone out, it co go goes and does its thing, comes back and lands, and then somebody else has got to swap that drone or that battery so that it can go back out again. So we decided to build something that was autonomous, self-sufficient, have a very rapid response uh, to leaks and, and alarms and things of that nature, and then above all, have no human element. And we wanted to make sure that the system or the drones are able to do their amazing work, but put something behind it that keeps them in the air or keeps them working. And so that's where the artist comes in. That's where the artist comes in. So our future plans are initially to go out in oil and gas and try to assist the companies in using whatever drone they need to use and using whatever sensor they want to use and helping them eliminate leaks on their gathering system. So that's our first, that's kind of our phase one. And then beyond that, we're going to work into the, um, the pipeline and we're going to try to assist companies uh, that are working in the, uh, the uh, midstream in assisting them and looking for leaks and, and detecting leaks instead of using the expensive aircraft. So this one, of course, is a, 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 is a shot of all of the uh, liquid and gas carrying midstream pipelines in the United States. And there's just, frankly, millions of miles. And right now they're doing all the inspections with aircraft and we're intending to come along with our system after we work with the upstream uh, industry and put in uh, fixed wing aircraft uh, on our landing station as well and have it fly these. So there's a lot of strategy associated with uh, with what we're doing beyond what I'm saying. But this is just a, a, a progressive next step. And then, of course, we're going to get into other areas and other segments of industries as well. With the uh, artist. How long does how long can the artist stay out in the field without being uh, maintained or ha having its uh, I don't know fuel supply re uh, replenished or something like that? Yeah, the the artist itself is meant to be plugged into ground power, shore power, oh. and uh, since we're out there amongst you know uh, well sites and power stations, we just simply ask them to install either a one ten or a two twenty. And uh, we'll, they'll install that, we'll plug it in, and the system will be able to, to essentially sustain itself uh, nonstop. Wow. So there's no limit to how long it can stay out as long as it has power. We are shooting for an eight-hour power reserve with onboard batteries. So we have uh, a bunch of batteries stacked into the bottom of this thing that power it even if the power goes down. So a perfect example of where this would be useful was a few years ago, I'm sure Susan remembers, we had, actually it was last year, we had so much rain that it flooded out many of the uh, well sites uh, of, of, of many of the companies around Tulsa. And uh, right. they would come to people and they would say, I would just like to get a, a view of my well site to see whether or not I am, whether I have a problem. I just want to get a view of it. And the power was down on the station. You know, they didn't know whether or not they that they had anything leaking out. The roads were closed where they couldn't get to it. And with the artist exactly. station being um, remote and, and under its own power, it, we could have launched a drone for at least three hours and all the way up to eight hours and kept that drone in the air constantly looking at the well site. So we could still um, continually give that power. Now, there's another uh, system that we're developing, and that is a reserve power source that can actually um, work off of solar panels and plug straight into the artist and supply power uh, for however big the trailer of uh, batteries you want to put into it. So there is options in there. There are, are options. 
but it's designed to be plugged into shore power. That's awesome. super interesting. And again, like you were saying, though, the big floods, those, those are, I mean, imagine all the things that, that all the potential problems that you, you mitigated or, or at, at least um, intervened with by being able to have that timely response. I mean, I keep thinking about that. It's just like, it, it, it's timely and it's safe. It's just amazing. It's incredible. If, if, if it really is, I mean, I, 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 I very much sound biased and I am, but uh, <laughs> it really is an incredible product. Um, being able to take this out, and here's a kind of a funny video that we shot right before uh, the Eurotech conference this last year. And uh, we did it, you know, kind of real quickly. But uh, this was a the lease operator at a at a field, a local field, and we kind of ran a competition between the the lease operator and the drone to see whether or not we could get um, uh, to try to try to get some uh, idea of how uh, what the competition would look like if we were actually to have the lease operator leave right before the drone took off. So what we did was, <laughs> is I went with the That's lease great. operator and we went to the different well sites just on his typical day. And it wasn't even fair. <laughs> um, we were yeah. able to not only do leak detection, but we were also able to inspect infrastructure um, uh, to what the lease operator wanted, um, inspect the infrastructure in such a way that uh, the uh, lease operator was done, you know, after five or six hours with what we were able to do with the uh, drone in about uh, 60 minutes. So it was just an incredible uh, amount of of um, so much time is saved utilizing the artist, uh, it makes the pumper so much more efficient that they are able to handle many more times what they're able to do without the artist itself. Uh, and and if looking at it a different way, a lot of people say, well, you're trying to eliminate pumpers' uh, jobs, and we're not. It, it actually, what this does is uh, a pumper would never go out and try to inspect their well sites today or inspect for leaks today you, without utilizing a vehicle. They just wouldn't do it. It's just mm -hmm. another tool that is in the pumper's arsenal that allows them to do a more effective uh, inspection process. So um, whenever we are, uh, whenever they're using the artist, gives them these tools just like it was a wrench or just like it was a car. And uh, by the time you get done with this entire video, watching everything, it works out to where the pumper uh, inspects um, the pumper inspects I think a total of 12 production wells two injection wells and hits 31 potholes and 13 miles driven <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and as far as oops that, that automatically sequence it wasn't supposed to um, and as far as what we did we did 21 uh, production wells in 28 minutes 18 injection wells and four pipelines and that keeps on for that's no, I shouldn't do that that's amazing and now so was that Eric from Samson I'm sorry. Was that Eric from Samson? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I was trying not to identify <laughs> him. On I there, met, yes. We've met him. Yeah, I met him before. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, he's a he's a great guy. He's been a great contributor to what we are doing uh, out here um, and and development. But uh, it's it's he's been a great contributor uh, to to what we do. So shout out to shout yeah. out to him. He's awesome. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, he was he he was a, an early true believer because I mean he he saw the dangers and and another thing too like this gives a record so you can go back and review it later. Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, one of the things that we actually do uh, with our current system is we actually upload uh, the information to the um, uh, to a, to a particular place um, for the cloud. And the company can come back and look at it anytime they want to. And we, we didn't realize how valuable that was to the company. So just the other day, we were talking to the to um, the uh, one of the pumpers, and they said, "Look, whenever the um, Oklahoma when the Oklahoma uh, Commission comes out here, I can't remember what it is, um, comes out here, and they see and there's a leak, we have to report to them how long that leak's been going. And it is nothing more than educated guess as to how long that leak is going until we got your system. And now we can actually go back and look." and determine how long that leak has been going on based upon what we've seen uh, the previous days. So it's really useful for them uh, to have a log of, um, of the system. And one thing that we're coming out with that um, nobody has seen yet is we came out with an on-demand system. So we were actually able to take uh, 
and operate the system from Houston in Tulsa. So an executive nice. can go say, I want to look at well site ABC or one, two, three and click request. And the artist will give them a countdown on their computer saying how long it'll take for the drone to get there. So an engineer can say, I want to take a look wow. at it. Now this video that you're seeing is actually uh, an engineer actually driving the camera and we're still perfecting it, but uh, they're actually driving the camera. The drone is keeping the guy completely safe. So we have what we call a no fly zone uh, around this well site. Um, and the drone cannot go over that well site. Um, it, we've got it plugged into our software. No matter what happens, uh, the drone will not allow the user to get over the top of that well site. So as you yeah. can see, he can zoom in quite a bit there and look at his well site. But uh, um, we don't allow the drone to fly over that. We're just a, if the drone loses connection and it's coming back, it automatically path plans around these no-fly zones. So we don't fly over any customer's infrastructure that they don't want us to fly over. And if the executive wants to drive the camera themselves or the engineer wants to drive the cameras themselves and take a look at their particular well site, they can do that remotely. Now, that's something that's coming in the future. It's not uh, something that we've enabled yet, but this is just kind of the, the, the pilot and trial version. Uh, but they can sit in their office and drive this straight from their office and take a look at their well sites. Um, and it also takes that video and uploads it to the cloud so they can revisit it as well. So there's a lot of stuff we're building in for the future. Nice. Well, well, Harold, is it that time? Yeah, we're getting you want to... to answer, yeah. You want to ask a question? Yeah, we've got our question that we always ask here on Life Edge, and that is, Brian, what would you say has given you an edge in life? In life? Yes. Um, I would say uh, faith. That's what I would say. Um, there Why? is nothing but my faith that I can that I can claim for any successes that we have uh, or anything of that nature. Um, there's definitely something else out there that has given me a uh, success that's beyond my comprehension. Um, that no, no, it may sound goofy to some people, but uh, if you're in my shoes, you certainly wouldn't think so. And I know a lot of other people's got the same thought process. There's no way I can claim successes that some of the successes that I've had. Um, and uh, then just a, a positive mindset towards things would be a second thing. Uh, always having a negative or down mindset towards yourself and always having a negative down mindset that you can't accomplish something is, um, is something that uh, I see hinders a lot of people. Um, if you see a dream that you want to go after and you and you think about it and you, of course, you're not, a dream is not a reality until you make a plan and do it. But uh, uh, if you see a dream that you want to go after and you've got something in the back of your mind that you want to do and you begin, then you're always more likely and you're always closer to get there than somebody that is sitting and just dreaming. So um, my faith would be the, the, the primary thing. Um, and then secondly, on top of that, would be just start. You know, that's, uh, that, that would be the key to actually winding up where you want to go. Great. It's a good uh, answer. Um, Harold, for some reason, that, um, does, Brian, did you turn off your camera? Because we, we see the nice video, but we don't see you. <laughs> uh, I have my camera on right now. Uh, oh, turn okay. off. You'll have to stop screen sharing, actually. There, there we go. There we go. Now we see you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, He's I, like, I was doing something. Answering this, uh, using this nice philosophical answers, and we're seeing uh, <laughs> just, a, just a well. <laughs> Sorry, I stopped that, so it should clear up now. Yeah, we see you now. Well, okay. Thanks. I really thanks so like much your for answer. Coming it's on, really yeah. wonderful. It's inspiring. Yeah, and that, you're right about answer. having a positive mindset of, about oneself, or like being filled with negative uh, self-talk and all that. That that's just the biggest you know showstopper of anything. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Whenever, in a bad somebody, way. <laughs> whenever somebody's got a dream and they don't either they either don't start or they have a the thought process of it's too complicated and I can't do it, then uh, those stop people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's well, true. Well, thanks for coming on, and we'd love to have you on again sometime. It, this this technology, I, I I just really see it exploding and just being. I I could see that this would this would be helpful in, you know, not just the energy, but uh, well, you you said you are doing it in multiple interest industries now too, right? Yeah, we're we're looking at it. Um, for instance, you know the the power line inspection is something that drones will ultimately uh, take over, and and uh, there's also you know police departments, fire departments, et cetera, et cetera, 
But our forte right now and what we've put all of our uh, efforts into primarily is oil and gas. And we'll get yeah. to those other industries. But right now, it's just wise to stay with oil and gas. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah, that's true. And like you said, it's it's already adding so much efficiency and effectiveness to what the pumpers can do. And it's it's only going to get better. So that's absolutely that's the, only, the only drawback we have right now is just getting the word out to the uh, companies, and that's what y'all are helping to do today. So yeah, and uh, I know Susan likes us, so hopefully she gets good word for us too. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, this is great, and you guys have come a long way since you were first in or it was uh, Pitchapalooza that evolved into U Pitch back um, three oh, years ago. We've so that's, got that's great. eight years away from where we started. Um, and initially our thought was, is, okay, we're just going to allow somebody else to do the drones. Uh, now we've got the system compatible with four different types of drones and are working on incorporating wow. other manufacturers into it um, so that we've got a whole gamut of sensors and a whole gamut of different drones that can be utilized. We're working on an Artist version 4. Nobody else knows about except for inside the company. So today be the, y'all show will be the first I'd announce it on. And uh, we're working on it here first. Four, and work with all <laughs> exactly. Uh, drones out there as well. So awesome. great. Well, thank you, Brian. This has been a wonderful yeah. interview. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everyone out there for joining in and watching us on Life Edge. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah.